Where Boards Fall Short by Barton and Wiseman, the January-February 2015 issue of the Harvard Business Review. Basically, the main theme is they felt boards aren't working. Um, despite watchdog groups, etc., um, the job's not getting done. And they go through four points where they feel boards are failing the most and how, um, in the author's opinion, they can correct things. And seeing how this is an MIS class, we're going to piggyback how IT can make um, the author's ideas come to fruition. So let's start with a simple definition of what the board of directors are. And most legal definitions that I've come across say, <clears throat> pardon me, that a board of directors is a group of people comprising the governing body of a corporation. Simplistic, uh, on the surface, seems straightforward and almost cut and dry. So let's go into and see what the traditional duties are. They recruit, supervise, retain, evaluate, and compensate managers, provide direction for the organization, establish a policy-based governance system, which we will go into more detail later, monitor and control, and their fiduciary duty to protect the organization's assets and members' investment. Um, recruit, supervise, that's capability audits of your personal, of your personnel rather. Um, compensate falls in the same category. Are you paying them enough to keep them there and not have them being ferreted away? Um, direction, that's basically um, an analysis of one's capabilities. Uh, what you do, what you can do, what you can't, who you serve, where you need to do improvement, um, you know, end-to-end -end processes, evals, and SWOT analysis. Governance, uh, two types, which we'll go on, mo uh, on more detail later. Monitor and control, it's the board's charge of uh, auditing processes and hiring the auditor um, to ensure compliance with regulatory issues such as Sarbanes-Oxley and to make sure it's done in a timely manner. And fiduciary, um, the board has a responsibility to represent and protect the members and investors' interest in the company. So the board has to make sure that assets of the company are kept in good order. That includes anything from the physical plants, you know, equipment, facilities, inventory, etc., to human capital. <coughs> Pardon me, uh, people who work within the company. So, what exactly is governance? Well, <coughs> pardon me. Applegate d d defines governance as the process of structuring operating and controlling the organization with a view to achieve its long-term strategic goals while serving the interest of its various stakeholders and complying with legal and regulatory requirements. It's kind of all there in this uh, sentence. We've got structuring, operating, controlling, long-term goals, strat strategy, um, regulatory. It's um, pretty well surmised right there. So again, I mean, all this seems pretty straightforward, right? You know, and even with the addition of watchdog organizations and legislations and the addition of IT, the duty should be relatively easier to carry forward and one would expect a high rate of compliance that th these things are being done. So in 2015, are these goals and duties being achieved at higher rates? No, they're not. <clears throat> you know, and this article is actually based on 772 board members and this is what they found. 34% felt their boards fully comprehended the organization's strategy. 22 felt the boards were completely aware of how their firm created value. I got to do that typo. 16 felt their boards had a strong understanding of the dynamics within their organizations, excuse me, organizations industry. Now let's look at that first point. 34% um, comprehend the strategy. Imagine if you would uh, be across the desk from a surgeon who said, well, you know, we're going to do this invasive cardiac procedure. And uh, once we open you up, I'm, uh, I'm about a third of the way sure how we're going to go about and, um, and make the, the outcome happen. Uh, you'd be running. You'd be running out of that office, or at least I hope you would. Also, on that second point, 22 percent, roughly one in five. Um, say that their boards know how their organization creates value. And, you know, you got to look at what the definition of the board of directors is again. You know, and here's the thing. All this IT exists to streamline, you know, to make things more efficient and more cost, um, cost uh, at a lesser cost. But it's not being utilized. You know, it's almost like they're playing into, you know, the devil's hand here, which might be this guy. Uh, 
Nick's looking pretty smug there, isn't he? And unfortunately, with the data that uh, this article is presenting so far, you know, he's got reason to. So again, a group of people comprising the governing body of a corporation. You know, how can these boards govern if the definition of governance of an organization is controlling, structuring, and operating the organization to achieve their long-term goals? Well, I'm hoping the question that comes to your mind now is how can this be fixed? You know, the first thing the author suggests is to instill in the board's mind what their fiduciary duty is. And they broke this down to two points. The first is loyalty putting companies' interests above their own. <clears throat> now, some may laugh at that, but um, it makes sense once you put it into context. The second is prudence, applying proper, scare, excuse, excuse me, proper care, skill, and diligence to business decisions. Now, it sounds really similar to conformance and performance. Remember, conformance is the area where theoretically um, Enron didn't have in place. You know, they were not paying attention to the books and they were manipulating the books. So it's conformance involves instituting controls and monitoring systems to ensure compliance of an externally defined requirement, you know, aka Sarbanes Oxley and everything that goes along with that. Performance, on the other hand, is implementing strategy so your organization can um, hopefully um, continue operations indefinitely and it can't go indefinitely unless you have long-term growth and strategy so what do they suggest four points selecting the right people spending quality time on strategy and engaging with long-term investors that seems you know i i you'd be hard pressed <clears throat> to find the average joe or anybody else for that matter um saying yeah that makes sense and People may balk at this, but paying directors more. But we'll go into that. Now, remember, as I said, this is an MIS class. And, you know, after we go through what the author suggests on each point, we're going to back that up with how, T, how, excuse me, how IT can enable that. So, pardon me. Um, and, you know, all of this builds business intelligence by referencing the records developed via IT. Now, the benefit I see is twofold. It's going to provide reliable, reliable information on people who I think as being on the fringe of the board to see if they're a right fit. These are, you know, people that the board uh, may have dealt with, um, you know, they know um, fairly well and they can, you know, look at metrics or whatnot from within the company um, or within partnerships to see if they're the right fit for what they're looking for. You know, the second, in the age of IT, information can be gathered on those outside the fringes, as I think, um, of boards, of board people that may be candidates. Um, you know, both of these will allow a better apple-to-apples -apple comparison and hopefully empower the organization to make better decisions um, without any um, obfuscation or any, um, you know, tricks thrown in there to skew the data. You know, the data is there. Um, and I think now more than ever, they have a better opportunity to make that true apples to apples comparison. So in turn, the right people in charge of the organization, or excuse me, organization can find balance between creativity, again, assuming they're not all like minded, and therefore instill strategic controls, which will define strategic positioning and prioritizing goals, operation control or short term operations, as well as um, conveying in a clear manner the board's vision for the future for everybody within the organization you know so basically IT is going to get you there and it's going to tell everybody else how it's going to how that's going to happen spending quality time on strategy now what they felt was spending more time on board related activities pertaining to strategy they suggested working a couple more days a year on average which was still like 35 days a year more importantly, they suggested going on the road to sales calls and holding meetings on location. Kind of giving someone the, uh, the boots on the ground mentality. And I'll tell you, these first-hand accounts will definitely allow for a better appre appreciation for the work that has to be done and is currently being done. And personally, you know, I think it would be a great thing to have them doing frontline job items uh, to really get the best picture for a day or so. But what's nice about this, though, is since 
you know, these board members are, you know, on the front line, so to speak, I think they're going to fully appreciate and have a better understanding of the problems that are there and hopefully look at IT as a solution to these problems or embrace the um, solutions that IT has developed and hopefully eliminate that black box view of IT where, you know, it's just this ominous presence that, you know, maybe a lot of these people fully don't understand. So how is IT going to enable better, uh, better spending quality time on strategy? Well, first, as we mentioned earlier, better business intelligence. You know, records on hand, it's all there. And a better grasp on the strategy and capabilities that um, IT produces. You know, as we discussed in previous slides, IT provides for better and more time-sensitive data to make better decisions for both the short and long term. Short-term benefits, again, will benefit from, you know, um, short term will benefit most from the hallmarks of IT, you know, as in real time data and analysis. And the IT impact and strategy will therefore explain how IT drives, excuse me, drives differentiation, sustainable advantages, as well as raise barriers to entry. All of which are the successful ingredients for long term growth. And all can be realized in the IT impact map as firms transition from one quadrant to the other, depending on their needs, as well as the dynamics within the industry. Engage with long-term investors. Um, this involves increased communication with institutional investors who are typically long-term and high volume. And they actually received a high level of positive feedback from this. So increased engagement allows the organization to better understand their external partners, what they expect, and will therefore they'll gain valuable insight in how not only to retain them, but hopefully to attract even new long-term investors. As I mentioned in the, in, the, in the slide, you know, the large investors actually claim that they have a bet, this better level of engagement allows them to service their clients better. So it's a top-down effect from the organization having um, better engagement, the long-term investors feel they can service their clients better. This will hopefully foster trust as well as build loyalty, which are um, great things onto themselves and, and a top help reduce certain transaction costs. And also, if the exterior partner feels a high level of loyalty to, this, to these organizations, as in the case, they'd be less likely to pull out their capital out of that organization and invest it in others. So therefore, what happens is, you know, the organization benefits from this because it's making harder for their long-term investors slash partners, you know, to switch. It's, it's raising a switching cost, so to speak, so they don't pull out their capital and invest in other people. So how is IT going to help this? Again, real-time pertinent information exchanged and provides an opportunity to highlight IT-driven differentiation strategies to investors. Um, number two, you know, kind of bragging rights, kind of, you know, meaning how the organization uses IT services. Um, hopefully they're proprietary services, which I happen to be more of a fan of after doing the readings, you know, to capitalize on opportunities and to show how these opportunities will ensure long-term growth and value for all the stakeholders. You know, imagine how that phone call would go if there was not creative thinking or management did not mine that gap of opportunities with existing technologies and current um, applications. Oh, you're not doing anything this year. Oh, okay. Apple, you haven't uh, put a new product out in 18 months. Uh, what's going on? Samsung's looking pretty good to us right now. Um, you know, it's, it's all there. Equally important are the financial models that IT can frame so that the organization can accurately gauge revenue, costs, and asset efficiencies. Um, they can better picture um, that they have more than they can um, stay true to their, pro excuse me, the better picture they have, the more they can stay true to their projections, which will in turn raise that level of trust with their um, exterior partners of the long-term investors. And hopefully by a good IT governance, contribute to the ease in which the organization can raise capital. So yeah, you know, we use our IT and our projections are X and for the last four, you know, eight quarters, we've always hit our projections. Well, you know, these long-term investors are going to feel a lot more comfortable investing in these firms that hit their projections, you know, with the help of IT, obviously, as well as having things in the pipeline than they would to somebody that doesn't. Paying directors more. <laughs> um, based on um, you know what they recommend is what some firms are doing uh, I believe it was Coca-Cola and Johnson & Johnson they're having their directors having more skin in the game um, 
personally having to purchase five times their annual cash retainers in stocks and options mature only after the director leaves you know the rationale behind this is if the director is using his or home his or her own money they're much likely to be a better steward and by having options that mature after the directors left um, although they didn't specify how long um, you know they could op exercise those options it definitely promotes long-term growth and planning overall better transparency is produced and in the end it boils down to how well the firm leverages information gleaned from IT. Enabled, IT enabled paying directors more. If you listen quietly, you can hear the activists yelling now. Properly leverage IT to make better decisions. Um, help find competitive niche markets. Expand to new markets and product lines. Improve efficiencies in current processes via conducting end-to-end -end audits. Best of class services for today's projects as well as tomorrow's. And be the firm with the best prospects for long-term growth, as that's how fortunes are made in stock options. You know, you're in competition to get, you know, the best um, chairman of the board, the best board directors, because these are the people that are going to guide your strategy. These are the people that are going are to, you know, guide that ship for the long term. You know, I know this sounds like the capabilities audit of properly evaluating people and partners, but again, you know, you're bidding, you, you could be in a bidding war for certain members to be on your board against competing firms. And um, having decided that these people must either put up some of their own money or delay compensation from stock options, you know, that might be harder um, to gain those people. So, you know, you, you got to bring something to the table. You know, so you got to let them know that these potential directors or board members that, yeah, you know, you're going to put some skin in the game. But through our use of IT, we're going to find those markets. We're going to explore and expand markets and product lines. We're going to be more efficient so that although, you know, you may not, you might not have the options next year as, you know, Toyota per se may, may let you do, you know, it's going to be longer than that. But in the long term, it's going to be more to your financial benefit. You know, it's kind of um, hard to put all these into one bullet point, but it's, it's not a one size fits all. You know, in the end, the organization must utilize technology to the fullest to show potential candidates that they'll be rewarded best over competing for firms. Again, if you notice, there's a lot of repeating themes here in all these presentations. You know, it's how you use IT is really what it comes down to. Um, you know, enhanced governance for utilization allows for achieving greater levels of efficiency, evaluating the perceptions of the organization, and again, it's more likely for you to obtain capital. All of these go with better governance. So, you know, if you look back in those stats in the beginning, you know, with 34%, you know, knowing what their strategy is or, you know, or how to create value one in five, you know, IT is not being used. So maybe a better question when these boards are interviewing people or looking for people, you know, are you a Carr or are you a Bryn Jolson? You know, I know the title of this slide is a little simplistic. It kind of reminds me of the boy band magazines. I used to see my earlier days working in, you know, Rite Aid or, you know, uh, Phase back when there was a Phase drugs as a community pharmacist with the, um, the mags that the, the, the little teenage girls would get. However, I feel it's an important question to ask, um, you know, and, I would explain to them who they both are and ask them, are you a Carr? Are you a Bryn Jolson? And regardless of what they said, I would most likely have them watch this video. If you haven't seen it already, it's about 12 minutes long. It's about running with the machines um, instead of opposed to them and the benefits thereof growth and the long-term growth that IT will have just you know, based Let's on... Let's yeah, start the, the story current, 120 current years ago when American factories began to electrify their operations, long -term igniting fully the second yet. industrial revolution. Of, uh, the amazing thing is the productivity so, not increased in those know, factories I'm gonna, I'm for 30 start this video, years. Actually. Um, you 30 can start years. from here if you prefer. That's long enough you may for have a generation seen of it managers so to save retire. The link. But you see, the first wave of managers is, great simply talk. replaced their steam uh, engines with electric lot. motors, definitely but they didn't redesign to, the factories to, to take advantage and of an electricity flexibility. It fell to the next generation um, to invent new work really processes, and then governance. productivity so, soared, thank you often for doubling or even tripling in those factories. Electricity is an example 
of a general purpose technology, like the steam engine before it. General purpose technologies drive most economic growth because they unleash cascades of complementary innovations like light bulbs and, yes, factory redesign. Is there a general purpose technology of our era? Sure, it's the computer. But technology alone is not enough. Technology is not destiny. We shape our destiny. And just as the earlier generation of managers needed to redesign their factories, we're going to need to reinvent our organizations and even our whole economic system. We're not doing as well at that job as we should be. As we'll see in a moment, productivity is actually doing all right. But it has become decoupled from jobs. And the income of the typical worker is stagnating. These troubles are sometimes misdiagnosed as the end of innovation, but they are actually the growing pains of what Andrew McAfee and I call the new machine age. Let's look at some data. So here's GDP per person in America.、Uh, there's some bumps along the way, but the big story is you could practically fit a ruler to it. This is a log scale, so it looks like steady growth is actually an acceleration in real terms. And here's productivity. You can see a little bit of a slowdown there in the mid 70s. But it matches up pretty well with the second industrial revolution when factories were learning how to electrify their operations. After a lag, productivity accelerated again. So maybe history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. Today, productivity is at an all time high. And despite the Great Recession, it grew faster in the 2000s than it did in the 1990s, the roaring 1990s. And that was faster than the 70s or 80s. It's growing faster than it did during the second industrial revolution. And that's just the United States. The global news is even better. Worldwide incomes have grown at a faster rate in the past decade than ever in history. If anything, all these numbers actually understate our progress because the new machine age is more about knowledge creation than just physical production. It's mind, not matter, brain, not brawn, ideas, not things. That creates a problem for standard metrics because we're getting more and more stuff for free, like Wikipedia, Google, Skype, and if they post on the web, even this TED Talk. Now, getting stuff for free is a good thing, right? Sure, of course it is. But that's not how economists measure GDP. Zero price means zero weight in the GDP statistics. According to the numbers, the music industry is half the size that it was 10 years ago. But I'm listening to more and better music than ever. You know, I bet you are too. In total, my research estimates that the GDP numbers miss over $300 billion per year in free goods and services on the internet. Now let's look to the future. There are some super smart people who are arguing that we've reached the end of growth. But to understand the future of growth, we need to make predictions about the underlying drivers of growth. I'm optimistic because the new machine age is digital, exponential, and combinatorial. When goods are digital, they can be replicated with perfect quality at nearly zero cost, and they can be delivered almost instantaneously. Welcome to the economics of abundance. But there's a subtler benefit to the digitization of the world. Measurement is the lifeblood of science and progress. In the age of big data, we can measure the world in ways we never could before. Secondly, the new machine age is exponential. Computers get better faster than anything else ever. A child's PlayStation today. Is more powerful than a military supercomputer from 1996. But our brains are wired for a linear world. As a result, exponential trends take us by surprise. I used to teach my students that there are some things you know, computers just aren't good at, like driving a car through traffic. <laughs> That's right. Here's Andy and me grinning like madmen because we just rode down Route 101 in, yes, a driverless car. 
Thirdly, the new machine age is combinatorial. The stagnationist view is that ideas get used up, like low-hanging fruit. But the reality is that each innovation creates building blocks for even more innovations. Here's an example. In just a matter of a few weeks, an undergraduate student of mine built an app that ultimately reached 1.3 million users. He was able to do that so easily because he built it on top of Facebook, and Facebook was built on top of the web, and that was built on top of the internet, and so on and so forth. Now, individually, digital, exponential, and combinatorial would each be game changers. Put them together, and we're seeing a wave of astonishing breakthroughs, like robots that do factory work, or run as fast as a cheetah, or leap tall buildings in a single bound. You know, robots are even revolutionizing cat transportation. <laughs> But perhaps the most important invention, the most important invention, is machine learning. Consider one project, IBM's Watson. These little dots here, those are all the champions on the quiz show Jeopardy. At first, Watson wasn't very good, but it improved at a rate. Faster than any human could, and shortly after Dave Ferrucci showed this chart to my class at MIT, Watson beat the world Jeopardy champion. At age seven, Watson is still kind of in its childhood. Recently, its teachers let it surf the internet unsupervised. <laughs> the next day, it started answering questions with profanities. <laughs> Damn. But you know, Watson is growing up fast. It's being tested for jobs in call centers, and it's getting them. It's applying for legal, banking, and medical jobs, and getting some of them. Isn't it ironic that at the very moment we are building intelligent machines, perhaps the most important invention in human history, some people are arguing that innovation is stagnating? Like the first two industrial revolutions. The full implications of the new machine age are going to take at least a century to fully play out, but they are staggering. So, does that mean we have nothing to worry about? No, technology is not destiny. Productivity is at an all-time high, but fewer people now have jobs. We have created more wealth in the past decade than ever, but for a majority of Americans, their income has fallen. This is the great decoupling of productivity from employment, of wealth from work. You know, it's not surprising that millions of people have become disillusioned by the great decoupling, but like too many others, they misunderstand its basic causes. Technology is racing ahead, but it's leaving more and more people behind. Today, we can take a routine job. Codify it in a set of machine-readable instructions, and then replicate it a million times. You know, I recently overheard a conversation that epitomizes these new economics. This guy says, "Nah, I don't use H&R Block anymore. TurboTax does everything that my tax preparer did, but it's faster, cheaper, and more accurate. How can a skilled worker compete with a $39 piece of software? She can't." Today, millions of Americans do have faster, cheaper, more accurate tax preparation, and the founders of Intuit have done very well for themselves. But 17% of tax preparers no longer have jobs. That is a microcosm of what's happening, not just in software and services, but in media and music, in finance and manufacturing, in retailing and trade. In short, in every industry. People are racing against the machine, and many of them are losing that race. What can we do to create shared prosperity? The answer is not to try to slow down technology. Instead of racing against the machine, we need to learn to race with the machine. That is our grand challenge. The new machine age can be dated to a day 15 years ago when Gary Kasparov. The world chess champion played Deep Blue, a supercomputer. The machine won that day, and today a chess program running on a cell phone can beat a human grandmaster. It got so bad that when he was asked what strategy he would use against a computer, Jan Donner, the Dutch grandmaster, replied, "I'd bring a hammer."
<laughs> But today, a computer is no longer the world chess champion. Neither is a human, because Kasparov organized a freestyle tournament where teams of humans and computers could work together. And the winning team had no grandmaster, and it had no supercomputer. What they had was better teamwork. And they showed that a team of humans and computers working together could beat any computer or any human working alone. Racing with the machine beats racing against the machine. Technology is not destiny. We shape our destiny. Thank you. Yacht Master 2, created to meet the specific demands of competitive regattas, featuring a unique countdown function with mechanical memory, programmable from 10 minutes to 1, and designed for optimal legibility no matter what the conditions. An unprecedented combination of complexity and simplicity. The Rolex Way.